Hello everyone, welcome back to part two of my discussion of Archimedes Psammites, aka the Sand Reckoner, or perhaps better understood as the Sand Dweller, as I said in my last video. I talked there about Archimedes' system for describing numbers up to 10 to the power of 8 times 10 to the 16. And now we're going to look at how he showed off this system by demonstrating that he could use it to state a number larger than the number of grains of sand in the universe, at least as the Greeks imagined the universe. Archimedes considers two meanings of the word cosmos, the thing that we're eventually going to imagine filling with sand. The more minimalist one just focuses really on the sun and assumes a static earth with the sun orbiting on the surface of a sphere concentric to the earth. Archimedes says that this was a pretty familiar idea in Greek astronomy at the time. Basically, with this geocentric perspective, over the course of a year, the sun appears to do a circuit of this oblique circle, which is itself embedded in a sphere that's doing a daily spin around the Earth's polar axis. As for the second meaning of cosmos, we're enormously grateful here to Archimedes for including evidence about the heliocentric model of Aristarchus of Samos, who lived a generation earlier in the third century BC. One empirical problem with a heliocentric universe is that the stars appear to travel through the sky in circles of fixed size throughout the year, so they seem to be spinning relative to the Earth's axis and not have anything very much to do with the Sun. And Aristarchus realised that this objection would disappear if the stars were vastly further away than the Sun, and you could then in principle have a fixed Sun and fixed stars and the Earth doing its daily rotation to explain their apparent movements. Aristarchus seems to have believed that if the Earth's orbit around the Sun, relative to the diameter of the whole cosmos, corresponded to the Earth's circumference relative to the whole cosmos in the geocentric model, then variation in the angles from the Earth to the stars, so stellar parallax, would be too small to be believed. And indeed, it actually took until the 1830s for scientists to measure stellar parallax. So, how many grains of sand would fill each of these cosmoses? We're going to start with the smaller one, and the first step is to measure limits for the angular diameter of the sun. That's the apparent angle at one's eye between light travelling from the left and the right edge of the sun, or the top and bottom, if you like. So Archimedes got up early one morning and observed the sunrise along a ruler, which I'm depicting here from overhead in blue and he moved a small cylinder in purple along the ruler and he marked two positions, the dotted one where the cylinder didn't quite obscure the sun and the solid one where it completely obscured it. Archimedes then got an upper limit for the width of the pupil in his eye using pairs of very, very thin cylinders. He put one right next to his eye and one further away. And the idea is, if the near one is thinner than the width of your pupil, then you can see past it in a rather blurry way, much as this photo shows that the lens on my phone camera can see past a paperclip. But if the near cylinder is wider than your pupil, you won't be able to see past it to the far cylinder. And what we do is use the smallest such cylinder that obscures your view as the upper bound for the width of the pupil. Then we can say the angular diameter of the sun is less than that of the solid circle when we replace the eye, the pupil, just with a point simply at the tip of the ruler. And the angular diameter of the sun is more than the angle between the tangents of the dotted cylinder and the cylinder that we're using as a slightly large approximation of the pupil. And with this experiment, Archimedes found that the angular diameter of the sun was somewhere between 1 over 200 and 1 over 164 of a right angle. Uh, that's what this sort of L shape is doing here. Um, the upper bound here is pretty accurate. The actual value varies between about 1 in 172 and 1 in 166 of a right angle. The business here using the entire width of the pupil makes the lower bound a bit looser, but this actually won't matter later on in the argument. Archimedes then uses these limits on the angular diameter of the sun to make an argument about the ratio of the diameter of the sun 
versus the distance between the centres of the Earth and the Sun. And remember, that's the radius of this geocentric smaller cosmos. Now, before we get into that argument, we're going to need the following lemma. Given two right-angled triangles with the same length upright, the ratio of the angles opposite it is less than the inverse ratio of the bases. And here I've drawn the triangles with one and the same upright. On the next slide, the equal uprights are actually going to be two different radii of the sun. Now, Archimedes doesn't prove this result, um, which is equivalent in modern terms to showing that the function tan theta divided by theta is increasing. So how are we going to do this? I'm going to borrow the proof from Dijksterhaus's wonderful book on Archimedes. What we do is draw the line through D that's parallel to AC and a circle sector that's centered at D goes through E and it goes between the lines AD and BD, which you have to extend. Then we can say the two angles at D are proportional to their sectors, but the upper sector is smaller than the triangle ADE, whereas the lower sector is larger than the triangle. So the ratio of angles is less than the ratio of the areas of these triangles, and that's the same as the ratio of the, the base segments AE and EB. And then adding one to each side, we have our result, because remember ABC and EBD are similar triangles because of their parallel sides. So now we know that, and we also know something about the angular diameter of the sun. Now, in this diagram, the sun is the orange circle centered at S, the Earth is the blue one centered at E, and the viewer of the sunrise is at V. We've chosen our viewpoint so that V is just simply at the top as we look. The tangents from V to the sun touch at T and U, so this angle at V is the angular diameter that we measured before, and the tangents from E touch at X and Y, and then they go on to meet the outer shell of the cosmos, the circle that's centered at E and passes through S, um, at points A and B. And our aim is to find a lower limit for this angle at E. Well, firstly, it's clear that E is further away from S than V is, because we're look considering a viewer who's looking at the sunrise, we know that VT is tangent to both these circles, so the horizontal distance from S to V and E is the same, while the vertical distance to E is clearly greater. So that means that the angular diameter of the sun when viewed from E is going to be less than the angle viewed from V. We're a bit further away from the sun, so it looks a bit smaller. This gives us an easy upper bound for how edge AB relates to this radius ES. AB is less than the arc AB, and that's less than 164th of a quarter of the purple circle. And then we can use Archimedes' knowledge that the ratio of the quarter circle to the radius, what we would call pi over 2, is a little bit below 11 over 7. And if you don't know about this, you can check out my videos on uh, Archimedes' text, the measurement of the circle. Anyway, there's a cute fact here about um, AB, which might not be obvious at first glance. It's actually the same as the diameter of the sun. The key point for seeing this is that BEM and SEY are congruent triangles. They're both right-angled, they share an angle at E, and they share a hypotenuse. So that means that AB, or twice the length BM, is also the same as twice the length SY, so it's the, the diameter of the sun. And now Archimedes assumes absolutely correctly that the sun is bigger than the Earth, so from that we can see fairly easily that the closest approach of the Earth and Sun, which I've labelled PQ, takes up over 99% of the distance ES. At this point, we go back to that preliminary result, the lemma that we looked at. The ratio of the angles at V and E, so they're in right angle triangles with the same opposite side length, namely the radius of the Sun, is less than the inverse ratio of the tangents from them to the Sun. So. EX then is itself less than ES, and VT is more than PQ, because remember PQ by definition is the shortest distance from the Earth to the Sun. So we can use this to infer that the angle at E 
is more than 99% of the angle at V. In fact, just to stick with round numbers, Archimedes uses a right angle over 250 as his lower bound. And that means that AB is a bigger chord than the, size, the, the side of a regular thousand-sided polygon inscribed in the, the purple circle. So that means that a thousand times AB is going to be more than the perimeter of that one thousand-sided polygon, and that's more than the perimeter of an inscribed hexagon, which we know is six times the radius. Well, I just love this very ingenious approach to a problem that nowadays you would just charge into with trigonometry and a calculator. Um, if you do do that, then you'll find that the lower bound of the angle at E is only t a tiny bit lower than the lower bound for the angle at V. You could replace this 250 if you wanted with something like 200.005. But Archimedes doesn't actually need a precise bound, and so he manages to do the whole thing with quite nice round numbers, um, obviously avoiding trigonometrical functions, which are a, a later development. Well, we now have a relationship where the diameter of the geocentric cosmos is less than a particular multiple of the diameter of the Sun. And now we're just a few assumptions away from finding a limit for the size of that cosmos. With these assumptions, Archimedes really tried to play things safe. For example, his acquaintance Eratosthenes measured the Earth's circumference at 252,000 stades, the ancient unit of length related to the length of a running stadium. Well, stades weren't actually a standardised size, but they were roughly in the region of 180 metres. So Eratosthenes measurement was probably a little bit on the high side. But anyway, Archimedes says that based on previous opinions, we can be confident that the Earth's perimeter is less than 3 million states. So he gave himself plenty of margin for error. Unfortunately, another of his assumptions, though again, he tried to play things safe, was a bit further off the mark. Based on previous opinions about the ratio of the diameters of the Sun and Moon, which ranged from 9 to 20, he supposed that the ratio of the diameters of the Sun and the Earth was probably less than 30. In fact, was very certainly less than 30. Well, in fact, it's a little bit over 109. So that didn't work out quite so well. Archimedes also didn't question Aristarchus' principle about how his cosmos compared to the normal geocentric one. Aristarchus' stars could be, and in fact they are, vastly further away so his model doesn't actually offer an upper limit on the size of the universe. Now, Archimedes might have noticed that, but his main concern, in any case, was to adopt generous assumptions that his readers would accept. And since Aristarchus' universe was already so much bigger than most people were accustomed to believe, he, he left it untouched. Well, using all these assumptions, it's quite a simple matter to argue that the diameter of the geocentric cosmos is less than 10 to the power 10 stades, and that of Aristarchus' cosmos is then less than 10 to the power 14. Then, of course, we've got to look at the proportions downwards from a stade to a grain of sand. Nowadays, sand is actually defined by its diameter, but Archimedes' starting point is just a simple assertion that surely there are fewer than 10,000 grains in a ball of sand that's the size of a poppy seed. And that does actually seem to be true, probably, by the modern definition of sand and my observations of the size of a poppy seed. Archimedes then measured how many poppy seeds lined up to the width of a finger. He found that 25 were enough. I thought 20 or so were enough, but maybe Archimedes had fat fingers. I don't know. Anyway, he uses the figure 40. So again, he's just playing things safe. And then there are 16 finger breaths in a foot, 600 feet in a stade. And so 10,000 finger breadths is just over a stade. Those ratios were, were standardised. Now, Archimedes knew, um, as of course did Euclid too, that the volume of a sphere is proportional to the cube of its diameter. And he didn't worry at all about packing problems, about wh whether you can pack grains of sand perfectly inside a larger sphere. He simply uses the ratio of the diameters of the universe and a poppy seed cubes that ratio, multiplies it by this 10,000. So overall, Archimedes concludes that if challenged to name a number larger than the number of grains of sand in the universe, 10 to the power 63 should be a safe bet. Where does that fall in his number system? Well, it's actually very, very much at the small end of it. 
It's just a matter of eighth numbers in the first circuit. And in fact, even now that we know that the observable universe is so much larger than Aristarchus imagined, we'd still only need the first circuit of Archimedes numbers to fill it with sand. So the numbers in Archimedes' higher circuits remain truly mind-blowing. I hope you found these videos interesting. Do consider sharing them and subscribing to the channel. I've got lots of plans for future videos on ancient Greek maths. Thank you very much.